Shalom, saints. Uh, thank you for joining me for this uh, devotional time together in the middle of this uh, week. Beautiful day today. I pray that you are in the midst of blessing. Um, we have uh, today the passage from Amos. That's one of the minor prophets. Um, that was our reading, Old Testament reading this past Sunday that we didn't cover. Uh, but as I mentioned Sunday, we're in that season where we talk about the things of the end and often referred to as the day of the Lord, although the day of the Lord is a broader uh, subject than the end because the day of the Lord uh, all, was any time it was kind of referring to uh, the Lord coming in judgment and setting things right. And so that's kind of the context, part of the context for today's passage. So let me read that from you and then uh, we'll um, think about it together. This is... Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for that. Let's continue with the, the context here. Uh, Amos wrote uh, in the years, really, uh, not too long before um, the Assyrian captivity took place. In 722 uh, BC, uh, the Assyrian Empire attacked the northern tribes of Israel, and the 10 tribes were scattered uh, all over, uh, and uh, as was the Assyrians' custom, they brought in people from other uh, captive uh, countries, and that's how uh, we have the Sam Samaritans. They were a mixed breed because uh, that was the practice of the Assyrians. They would take some out and bring some in. Um, and so uh, that judgment of the Lord did come that Amos was, is talking about in this book. And Isaiah prophesied it as well. Uh, they were in roughly uh, the same time period together, the two of them. Um, and the Lord had been warning uh, all of Israel for years uh, to repent, to return to him, that they had uh, forsaken his ways, they had set up idolatry of various sorts in their land, and uh, carried out uh, all manner of wickedness in accord with the nations around them. They, they weren't any different uh, than the nations around them, uh, though they played religion. Uh, they would certainly have called themselves uh, the Lord's people. Um, here's what the Lord said in chapter 4. He says, I struck you with blight and mildew. This is verse 9. Your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locust devoured, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword and carried away your horses, and I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. And on he goes with examples of how... Um, and again, what we have are various circumstances that were afflicting Israel, uh, but they failed to see the Lord behind it because the Lord had promised them that if they followed him, that he would protect them. Uh, if they honored him, uh, that their days would be prosperous and good, uh, but uh, they forgot him. They didn't uh, observe his uh, Torah, his instruction. Uh, and so then he sends them these warning signs that should have gotten their attention to say, what's going on here? Let's turn back to the Lord. They didn't do it. 
And eventually what happened, they declined more and more in their uh, walk with the Lord. Um, the great pastor James Montgomery Boyce put it this way when he's talking about spiritual uh, decline. It is important, he says, to understand two steps in the spiritual decline of nominally religious people, which of course we have a lot of those in our country today. Such people do not live for God, though they think they do. They live for self. And the first stage of their decline is to put off the day of reckoning. They don't think about it at all. At this stage, they know what is right and expect to do the right someday. But in the meantime, they want the imagined benefits of a life of sin. Then the second stage comes when sin has so trapped them and distorted their thinking that they lose sight of what is right or wrong and actually imagine their sin to be right conduct. At this point, far from putting off the day of reckoning, they actually desire it. They imagine that their deeds will be vindicated and that the people they have wronged will be shown to be deserving of their conduct. Wow, they flip it around. And that's exactly what uh, the Lord speaks to his people through Amos about. He tells them in chapter 4, verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. Verse 15, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph uh, if you follow him that way. So that's kind of the background. This is where they'd gone to. And so uh, the Lord says to them, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? See, you're thinking you're going to be vindicated and, and things are going to be made better for you, but rather the day of the Lord for you will be darkness and not light. And so there's one of the characteristics of the day of the Lord. It's gloomy, it's dark, it brings isolation. When, when it's dark, you can't see. Of course, it suggests then a, it'll be a day of chaos, of blindness, uh, but also isolation from one another, because if you can't see, I mean, at least in our physical distancing that we've had, we could wave, we can smile, you know, uh, we have technology where we can connect, but the day of the Lord is a day of darkness, just no connection. So think of anything dark, I mean, uh, that's associated with the darkness, scariness, isolation, those kinds of things, uh, that will be characterized in the day of the Lord. And then, this is amazing, it's, it's inescapable. You'll be uh, like you're running through uh, the jungle, escaping the lion, and having your head back and looking, and next thing you know, wham, you run right into a bear. Or, You've got a safe place. You know, our homes are expected to be safe. So whew, I, I made that. I'm in my home. And you lean against the wall and you get bit by a serpent. The Lord's point there is it's going to be inescapable in that day. No one will escape. Um, and it's hopeless. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? Uh, so what are you wanting this for? if you're not right with the Lord. And that's the key, we'll get to that in a minute. But then what the Lord says is, if you're in that place where you're not right with me, where you know, you've know you made uh, wrong right and right wrong, then your uh, religious practices are despicable to me, is the way he really puts it. You, you know, I despise your feasts. Well, the Lord told him to carry out the feast, just like he tells us to uh, honor him, come together in worship. Uh, we're to do that. He, to he tells us to do it. But if we do it without the right hearts, uh, then uh, he has no favor upon it. You are playing religion. And boy, do we have that in um, much of the church today and certainly in our culture. Um, and I can remember <clears throat> a man... Uh, a, a news anchor uh, saying, well, I'm a Christian, as he goes on then and uh, rails against um, uh, uh, those Christians who actually think to, to live out their faith in the public square, uh, which of course is exactly what we're supposed to do. Um, but he claimed to be Christian, and I, I fear for his soul um, as he stands before the Lord. May he repent, and that's of course the call and intent of this. Um, so the Lord goes on, take away from me the noise of your songs, 
Uh, you think of our praise songs, you know, and how wonderful they can be. I think of much of the church today where they've got excellent, excellent music, and yet their pastors do not preach the truth, and they lead the flock away. And again, uh, you know, they, they, they think that they're being religious, and yet they oppose the things the Lord calls us to do. Because here's the clincher. The Lord says in verse 24, but let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's a great passage. I've heard that for years uh, before I'd hardly ever, you know, when I was a little boy, before I heard <laughs> much about Amos. That's just that let justice roll down like waters. Um, you know, it was a, a, a big verse during the, um, uh, the, the 60s, et cetera, when we were looking for, uh, you know, racial justice, which we should do. Um, yeah, that call to justice. But here's the deal. We have hear that call again today um, by people, and justice does need to happen. But here's the deal. There's not true justice unless there's righteousness. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You cannot disassociate the two. Let me clarify further. It's not just unless it's right with God. Righteousness is being aligned with a holy God. And so we can cry for justice all we want, but if you don't apply his holiness, his truth to it, uh, then it's not gonna be just. For instance, in our culture today, in the name of righteousness, uh, fairness is the way that, you know, in the name of justice, uh, we want to have, uh, promote, you know, Anything goes gender-wise. You know, you pick your own gender. Or in human sexuality, in, in those relationships, uh, it, you know, it's, it's only fair. It's only just if, you know, uh, anybody can, uh, you know, hook up with whoever they want to, no matter uh, marriage or sex, you know, gender. Um, well, that may be, seem right to them, but to God, it's wrong. It's unholy. It's not what he created us for, and it's damaging to humanity. Uh, it undermines our humanity, as a matter of fact. I mean, there's just so much with that. But so the Lord would, would uh, not find that uh, just at all. In fact, so then it becomes uh, unjust when uh, people persecute those of us who stand for his truth and his righteousness in the name of their uh, idea of justice. So we've got to be very careful that when we cry for justice, that one, our own hearts are right, that our lives are right, that we're aligned with God's holiness. Uh, and then in being aligned with him, we can see more clearly the world and pursue that which is truly just. And that we should and we must. And one of the things for then all of us as Christians is self-reflection on whether we are pursuing righteousness holiness, and God's justice in the world. We have a storm coming. We have a storm coming, and we need to be uh, mindful of it and also know that for followers of Jesus, we have a shelter from the coming storm. So never give up hope on that. I'm reminded of that great hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Uh, may I, let me... Uh, rest in thee. Uh, it was a top lady, I think, was the author of the hymn. And the story goes, he was uh, in England. In the 1700s, a great storm was coming. And he ran for shelter. I guess he was out in the country or something like that. Found a, a huge rock uh, that he thought he'd shelter at. And he found even better, there was a crack in it, a cleft in that stone. And so he went uh, into uh, that cleft and was sheltered from the storm. And that brought to mind the um, escape from the coming storm by resting in the rock. And who's the rock? Jesus. He is our rock. He is our shield. He is our protector. And so we are all called to find our shelter in him. And we do that by trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. And that's the message that we are to declare to uh, New Braunfels to Texas and the world saints. So there's a coming storm. Uh, as Billy Graham said, if the Lord doesn't judge America, he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. 
Um, I happen to think he's, he's right. May we repent uh, in these days, but if not, uh, be ready. Find yourselves secure in Jesus the rock. Amen. Now, I have uh, a few words for you regarding uh, the uh, coming days ahead for us as a parish. Uh, we have been moving ahead and trying to uh, reestablish some of our uh, life and ministry together. Uh, a reminder, we do have the 8 o'clock service. Uh, this will be our third one. Uh, it's been great to uh, meet together at 8, and then uh, the children have a Sunday school, um, and then we have the 1030 service. This Sunday, uh, we will have again the drive through communion. And then also we will have our second five o'clock service. We had a wonderful time this last Sunday. Uh, Owen and Denby did a wonderful job leading us through and really a very, uh, I'd say, relaxed, intimate uh, time with the Lord together. Um, it was just it was uh, soothing for the soul. So if you are able to join us, please do, and especially invite your friends. That's, of course, our huge focus is to minister to some of our folks who may be out of town for the weekend and can get back for that, uh, or for people who are um, not connected with the church some way to find their way to be with us for worship and get incorporated in our parish family together. But uh, the Lord is moving uh in our midst. One last thing, and that is Sunday the 22nd, we have our vestry elections. Uh, and so we're gonna do uh, those, we, not our regular way with the parish meeting, but right after each service. Uh, and, uh, and that will include drive-through uh, voting. Uh, bylaws say you gotta be here. There's no absentee ballots here, no mail-in votes. Uh, you just come and join us and we will take those ballots uh, and, um, tally them for you. We've got wonderful candidates, uh, five of them. I wish they all could be on at the same time, but uh, do prayerfully consider uh, that call on their lives and come and vote. I love you all. I'm uh, blessed uh, to be your brother in Christ and to serve in your midst. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.